Hey everybody, Bobby Medina here with my very good friend and buddy Paul Barron. And uh, we are here to help trumpeters learn to play efficiently, combat the effects of aging, and improve even if you don't have a ton of time to practice. And we have a very uh, special guest artist with us today. He's actually an exoclinician artist uh, for Jupiter Company. He has spent uh, 15 years as a commercial player uh, professionally across Canada. And since there have been so many discussions here uh, about Doc Reinhardt, uh, he has been a student of Doc's for 10 years and is here to share some insights about the Reinhardt methodology. So welcome, Glenn Lipman. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you very much. Nice to be here, guys. Thanks for being here. Hey, so I'm going to throw out the first question, Glenn. Um, I, I, we'd love to know about how you first met Doc and uh, discovered his system. Um, well, I, uh, I started playing trumpet at an early age. I played in my dad's band. I played in uh, an orchestra for CBC, and everything was going great for about 15 years, and I played uh, as a commercial trumpet player. And in 1969, I went to uh, Berklee School of Music in Boston. And as you can imagine, um, the guys I encountered uh, were tremendous players. They were from all around the world. In fact, a uh, quick story is one of the guys that I met was from Rio de Janeiro. And he didn't speak too much English. And I had to help him fill out all the forms. And you may not, you may know his name. His name was Claudio Roditi. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> and, uh, and I met Claudio and, um, and I, I went to an ensemble with him and I started playing my little jazz solo. And then he did his jazz solo. And I'll tell you, I wanted to put my trumpet in the case and fly <laughs> home to Winnipeg. This guy was just unbelievable. I went to see him. At, uh, we were in the same, you have to stay in the dorm. So I went to his dorm room and I said, how did you learn how to play all like this? I mean, you're, you're just unbelievable. And he says, Glenn, I, I, I try to emulate all the greats. He says, ask, ask me to, to, and I said, okay, okay, do Louis Armstrong. He did Louis Armstrong. Do this, do that, do this, do that. He did everything. Anyways, most, this is the era of the screech trumpet player. A lot of the lead players that, that I encountered in, um, at Berkeley, they all had uh, uh, double G's, and a lot of them had a strong double C. And actually, they were they were they were trying to get up to the G above, believe it or not. Hmm. So what happened to me is because I had a um, being a commercial player, you know, I had a G, but not not as a lead player like you, Paul. And and uh, so I of course got into the practice room and I started playing harder and harder and harder just to compete with the guys. And basically, what happened to me is I played so hard that I got a cyst on the top of my lip. So I went uh, so I went home to uh, to Winnipeg. I saw my family doctor, and he took out an electric needle, and he Ooh. burned out that cyst. The problem is. It left scar tissue, and I had a low placement. So now uh, I had to take off uh, a number of months. And then when I tried to play, literally, because I had no formal training, my dad taught me how to play, I couldn't play a note. And I was just, I didn't know what to do. What could I do? So I went back to Berkeley. I changed my... Um, uh, instead of being um, uh, a trumpet major, I switched over to arranging and composition, which was not my which was not my s skill. I just didn't know what to do because I really couldn't play, and I wanted to continue studying. Anyway, so you know, I knew a lot of guys, and and there were a lot of guys in Berkeley that were going to visit a guy in Philadelphia, and his name was Doc Reinhardt. So I thought, you know, so I had problems and I talked to some of the guys and they said, look, man, if you're having trouble, you got to go see Doc in Philadelphia. I said, Doc, Philadelphia, Jesus, Murphy, what? Anyway, so I talked to my dad and he says, look, Glenn, he said, you know, if you got to go to Philadelphia, you got to go to Philadelphia. So I phoned, I wrote Doc a long letter with tears in my eyes and he wrote back to me and he said, Glenn, 
come to Philadelphia. I will do my best to help you regain your, your chops. So I, I phoned him up. I made an appointment. And I'll tell you, man, it was a nightmare. I had to take a bus, a Grey Goose bus or a Greyhound bus from Boston. And it left at midnight. I got to New York at 4 o'clock in the morning. And then I got to Philly early morning. I take a lesson from 9 to 10. Then I get back on the bus and go back to Boston. Wow. So that's how I met Doc Reinhardt. And basically, um, uh, the orientation, it was a two-hour orientation, and it was very interesting. I mean, basically, he, he was talking to me for about a half an hour, and I, I was thinking, what, what is this teacher doing? Is this a scam or what's going on, you know? And after about a half an hour, Doc says, you're probably wondering why I'm talking to you for half an hour. And I said, yeah, I was kind of wondering that, you know. And Doc said, he says, I'm, I'm studying your embouchure, Glenn. He says, I'm, I'm looking, when you talk, I'm seeing how your jaw moves. I'm seeing how your lips move. He says, I, he says I'm, I'm actually in the process of analyzing you. And then he did some tests and basically established try to establish what my pivot was uh, after he established what my pivot was then he then we looked at what my tongue was doing I was tongue in between my lips and he said this is not the way to tongue you have to do it another way and then he showed me or uh, you know uh, told me what 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 way I had to correct and uh, gave me an assignment and that was it I went home uh, took the bus home and I uh, just started working on Doc's stuff. So Glenn, give us a brief outline of how Doc discovered the pivot. Uh, that's a great question, Bobby. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to tell you uh, just, a, just a, a little bit of information or, or background on, on Doc Reinhardt, Donald S. Um, he loved the trombone. Uh, he was a very serious man, very serious boy. And when he took on something, he wanted to do it to the best of his abilities. So he started to play the trombone. He practiced uh, many hours a day. And he, you know, he went, he went to one teacher and he, he just hit a level. You know, we all hit levels and all of a sudden you can't get any better. So then he got frustrated and then he thought, well, I'll go to another teacher. So he went to another teacher. And one teacher says, well, you got to play long tones. And after about six months, Doc was getting nowhere. He's practicing a lot. He's playing his long tones. And then he goes back to the teacher after six months. He says, so what's the, you know, I, I'm practicing the long tones. I'm not getting anywhere. And, he's, and then the guy says, well, you know, give it time. And Doc says, well, I've been doing it for six months. How much time should I give it? <laughs> and then uh, he went to another teacher. Same scenario. Try this. Try this. And he went to many many teachers I'll, I'll say 10 teachers i don't know how many wow and nothing worked anyways one day doc uh, dinged his trombone slide and he so he had it repaired and then the trombone came back he took it out of the case just to see if it was working and everything and all of a sudden when he played a note he squeaked out a high beef a high f on the trombone now, Doc had been playing for years, studying with 10 teachers. He was never able to play higher than a B-flat. So how did he squeak out this F? Of course, being Doc Reinhardt, being the analytical guy that he was, oh, I noticed something. He took a look in the mirror, and the horn angle had come down considerably. And when it came down, it made the lips his lower lips roll in and that's how he played the high F and then Doc thought well why did the horn angle come down what what made that happen when they repaired the trombone they didn't put the counterweight back on ah oh. so the bell was top heavy and what happened is when it was top heavy the horn angle came down and all of a sudden Doc who had been practicing long tones and this and that all of a sudden he could squeak out a high up well you can you could think you know he was in ecstasy man it was like wow what's going on and then that's how the pivot system got started he everybody he played with 
uh, whether in, in, in high school or when he was playing professionally, everybody he played with, you know, if he would play a gig with Paul in the pit, he would be looking at Paul's chops and analyzing Paul and saying, gee, why, why does Arnie Tchaikovsky have that high placement or, or the low placement in the high angle? How come Bud Herseth has a low, a low, or, uh, a, a low angle of his horn? And then he would then he would look at all of these things and he would factor all of the information. And that was basically the beginning of the pivot system. And and um, um, I lost my thought here for a sec. Uh, so, Doc, you know, basically. Really analyzed all of these, he analyzed a lot of people. So well, that brings me to my next question, then. Can you ex explain, you know, give a, an outline of what the pivot system is? Yes, of course. Uh, what I wanted to do, just because there's been a lot of, uh, you see a lot of things on the Internet now and, and uh, even on the site that I love. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm thrilled with the job you and Bobby are doing with the tips for trumpet players over 50 and the trumpet diagnostics. It's wonderful. Thank you very much on behalf of the trumpet community. What I want to do just to make sure that we're totally accurate is I'm going to read a page from Doc's book and it's uh, and it basically says, what is the pivot? So I'm just going to read from Doc's uh, book here. Each and every brass instrumentalist who possesses the required range, power, flexibility, endurance utilizes the pivot as a means of coordinating his playing factors to his particular physical type, whether the manipulation is unconscious or subconscious. In other words, every brass performer pivots whether he realizes it or not. There's a lot of guys that say, oh, I don't think I pivot. Well, this fact I have proven for more than 40 years of research as an analyst and consultant for many thousands of brass players around the world. The primary purpose of the pivot is to form a natural lip pucker. Basically speaking, the pivot pulls or pushes the performer's lips into the path of the air column so that the air column will cause the lips to vibrate over the entire range of the instrument. In other words, a pivot is the physical means by which a performer may constantly maintain the all essential lineup of his lips with his teeth so that the required lip vibrations for the production of the sound are not hampered or impeded in any particular part of the range. I just thank you for letting me read that from Doc's book. I wanted to make sure we got it right. And, you know, uh, because this is a video, I know everybody will, will be able to say, I didn't get what he was saying, but they'll be able to go, to, to go back and forth and figure yeah. it out. Thanks for letting <laughs> me do that. Sure. Very cool. Well, that that's that's interesting. Can can I bef before we go on to the question I was thinking about you, I, I have one other question that I think is really important. And I think this is something that really needs to be clarified because there's all these stories about Doc that exist, uh, you know, that I've heard and I just want to I got my horn here so I just want to I want to try to clarify what Doc was talking about necessarily uh, wasn't necessarily the angle right as you were playing because that you play at I mean that can be part of it but he later didn't he later change the term pivot to tracking was is that correct no. or no, no that's incorrect okay so then there, so... there is a there i think what you're thinking about bobby is um and i think chris la barbara does um does um a little thing on uh, youtube where he demonstrates an exercise that doc uh did it's called the track routine okay that's what you're thinking about. Okay, so when we're talking about the pivot, then is that that is actually the angle at which your horn is being played? Is that correct? I think the biggest mistake that Doc made, forgive me, Doc, for saying this, is naming the the system the pivot system, and everybody thinks 
like you said, the pivot is moving the horn up and down and, you know, sideways and uh, some guys say flag waving. What he should have done is just written the, the encyclopedia as um, this is a, a brass encyclopedia for, you know, trumpet, trombone, French horn, tuba, and it just, and, and for brass cupped instruments. The pivot is the terminology uh, I feel could have been different, but really what the pivot is, it's the distribution of weight and the shifting of weight. And when you shift the weight, um, you shift the weight usually diagonally because you have malocclusion when you, when you, when you bite down. No, there's only one in a gazillion that has perfect teeth. So if you don't have, if you're one of the guys, regular guys that doesn't have perfect teeth like me, you, and probably Paul and a whole bunch of other guys, your, your pivot's going to be diagonal. But basically what you're doing is you're shifting the weight. So when you ascend, you will shift the weight. And when you shift the weight, you're actually pulling your lips slightly to one side or slightly to the other side. And what you're doing is you're allowing when you pull the lips, you're, you're allowing the air column to shift. And, and, and it puts your jaw for ascending in a certain classification for ascending. It puts your jaw in a certain position. When you descend, you do basically the opposite. Mm. So you, you, you know, then we'll have to talk about the, the, the pivot classifications. Okay, well then the next question then, and that, that pretty much clarifies it. And just for everybody else, when you have a malocclusion, and let me make sure I understand this correctly, if your jaw, if your jaw lines, it's like when your jaw lines up not perfectly centered, right? A malocclusion is when you're exactly, kind of exactly. sideways. Okay, so exactly. then, you know, the big question is, you know, that I think a lot of people, uh, you know, have, and I've certainly had over the years is, how how to determine you know how do you determine whether you're an upstream player or a downstream player that's a great question bobby um and i like it very much um the most important factor in determining if you're an upstream or a downstream player the number one factor is when you place the mouthpiece do you have more upper lip? Is, is your mouthpiece higher on your, on your top lip or is it lower? If you have, um, so, you know, a lot of time, you know, and Paul made mention of this one time about 50, 50, it's hard to say 50, 50 because our, our lips are not straight. They're not right. horizontal, vertical, that type of thing. You know what I'm saying? They're, we're, they're curved, right? So basically, if if you're um, uh, let's say your your lip placement is 60 40 top lip 60 bottom lip 40 you will be a downstream player if you if you're 70 30 you're a downstream player if you're 85 15 you're a downstream player and all of those um, percentages that I gave you um, they're doc has categories for each of those types uh, with the different percentages. If you are a upstream player, you have a low placement, usually 25% upper lip, 75% lower lip. So the first and foremost thing when I analyze uh, a player, I look at where his placement is. So if a guy's got a high placement, I a, 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 a quite quickly check the box and say, okay, I think we're going to deal with a downstream player. If he's got a um, lower placement, the box that I check is upstream player. So Glenn, Number can I ask one quick oh, question? Sure, sure, Just sure. with uh, using the example, because um, uh, Harry James, you know, was so high placement, um, like pretty much resting on the red of his lower lip. Um, but he looked like his horn was angling up. Now, just for my own clarification, because he's such high placement, 
does that mean he's a downstream player, even yes. though the angle of yes. his horn no. was up? That's what I'm saying, Paul. Okay, no, okay. Number one, number one, and I'll tell you what, we'll go through the classifications, on, and I will explain that exactly. Oh, okay, to excellent. You. And, I, I'm and, jumping the gun but, then, sorry. No, 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 you're not jumping. That's a great question, and you have we have to have an interaction here. But, you know, um, um, again, number one thing, if you got a high placement – Nine times out of 10, 99 out of 100 guys, if they got a high placement, they're downstream players. However, I have to make it totally clear, and Doc was adamant about this, there are exceptions to every rule. Uh. You know? Uh, there, there just is. And, and basically, it, it just could be, you know, how your teeth are formed, you know? Just maybe something very unique to Paul Barron or Bobby Medina or Glenn Libman. And so, but the, the number one thing is the placement. If the placement's high, if Harry James, if you feel that he has a high placement, I don't care if it's up to his nose, doesn't matter. It's a high placement. Yeah. He, in all, in all instances, he's a downstream player. So the number one thing to determine if you're an upstream player or a downstream player is your placement. High placement, downstream player, low placement, upstream player. The second determination is your horn angle. In most cases, if you're a downstream player, your horn angle will be horizontal or point pointing downward. But there is an exception. And actually, Harry James is that exception. So Harry James, and, and actually, I'll go to another player that's more current, and maybe the guys will, some of the guys will be more familiar with, but Harry James, of course, hey, what can I say? Uh, I love him. And uh, what a monster player. Of course, you know, he grew up in the circuses, and this guy had chops to burn. I mean, he was playing Zephs and Gs in the, God, what, the 30s or the 40s? I don't know. Anyways, this type of player is classified as a as a three. All downstream players are classified as threes. And in all cases, their horn angles are down, with the exception of a guy with a very high placement. And I'm talking... 75 or 85 almost up to his nose and a guy that you can really see that is chris Bodie. Uh -huh. if you watch if you watch chris play and he's a marvelous marvelous player and when you watch him play when he ascends the horn he lifts up when he descends the horn he pulls down so that's and you're classical. talking about his lips kind of raising up or raise or going down, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just Bobby, again, it's not flag waving. It's just when you raise your horn, you're just slightly right. guiding your lips in that diagonal position to open up the air wave. Okay. So that is the that is the exception, Paul. So basically. Usually when you see a guy with a high placement, uh, not a high placement, but a high horn angle, everybody assumes it's a down, it's an upstream player. You know, I mean, the, the ultimate uh, guy to look at as far as upstream players, one guy would be, you know, the f most famous Canadian lead player would be Arnie Tchaikovsky. You know, the other guy that, that, that's, uh, that's a, a no brainer as far as an upstream player with a high placement is, uh, our friend uh, and exo clinician uh, Roger Engram. Those are the typical upstream players. So, Bobby, you were wondering about the classifications, and I know you're you're. Uh, this is a, a thing you want to uh, to get across to the guys. Uh, there are two pivot classifications. Pivot classification number one is a unique one, and what you do is when you ascend, you push up or you raise your horn angle a little higher. When you descend, you pull down. This classification is unique. And that's the one I'm talking about for Chris Bodie mm -hmm. and Harry James. 
Uh, Paul, I wanted to say that one of the things I try to um, uh, be careful about is that when you analyze, especially famous players, uh, I, I think you've got to be very, very careful. Like, like even if I wanted to work with Bobby or you uh, in Zoom, you know, it would be, I could maybe do it, and I, I think I could do it, but, you know, it's always good to do it in person. So I think a lot of guys look at people on the YouTube and, and they'll talk about famous players and they'll categorize these famous players. And, you know, looks can be deceiving, you know, like, you know, a guy can have a, a, a really fleshy bottom lip, but when he's playing, he curls it in and you don't see that. And, and yet that'll affect maybe how he tongues. Class, pivot classification two is the most common classification, Bobby. So what you do is when you ascend, you pull down. So if your horn angle is, uh, let's say horizontal, the bell will, will just go down slightly. Mm -hmm. And when it goes down slightly, it shifts your weight. And again, think diagonally, not up and down, diagonally. And it's really the opposite when you descend. When when you descend, you you will pull slightly up. So the bell of your horn will go slightly up. So now, to figure out what your diagonal is, and you have to kind of kind of mess around with it, I would assume. To kind of experiment um, with to find no, it. No, it, it, it's actually an easy process if you if you have somebody that that that, that understands what the process is. Uh, and I think um, Paul made reference to this in one of the videos that I was watching about the four legs. And when you look at your chops, you, Doc would say there's four legs, you know, two on the top, two on the bottom. And his analogy would be if you have four legs of a squared table and I take away one of your legs of the table, what happens? The Topples table over. falls it falls down. So the thing is, if you have four legs and we determine, like for instance, for me, uh, what's crucial for me when I set my chops is my left lower leg. And what happens is when I get fatigued or I get tired, the weight shifts away from that, that left lower leg. And then my, my chops go, my sound goes, my range goes and everything. So the thing is, you know, the first thing to do is, uh, uh, and again, I'd be glad to do it for you, Bobby and, and Paul, you know, just you do an analysis and basically you, you, uh, you, you, you just do a, a simple test and it's basically a middle C to a G. But now we're getting into some real specific stuff. So let's move on. So, so Glenn, can you explain to us now that we know the classification of pivot, can you also now explain the, the different classifications, maybe I'm using the wrong word, but of the types of players. I understand there's A, B, C, D, is that correct? Um, well, it, it's just a matter of how you look at it. Uh, there, so there's four, four types uh, of players. You know, we don't say classification because there's the pivot classification, right. one and two, and then there's four types uh, of players. And this is based on uh, Doc's analysis of um, uh, the teeth, the gums, um, um, and the pivot classifications applied to the different players. So the, of the four types, uh, type number one and type number two are very, very limited. So just to give you just a, a real quick um, scenario about type one, is a guy with even teeth, no overbite, no underbite. This guy is one of the zillion and he has got perfect teeth. So this guy, he can play with a high placement. He can play with a low placement. He can do anything he wants. And you'll probably, you know, at six years old, you probably hit a double D, you know, <laughs> cause I mean, he's just, he's just his, his, it's just his face is just perfect. So, I mean, obviously, um, there's only one player, I believe, uh, that I met uh, in Philadelphia taking a lesson with Doc. 
uh, his name was Lynn Biviano. And as legend has it, Lynn, uh, when he played lead for Buddy Rich's band, he was able to play a couple of sets. And when he got tired, he actually was able to move his mouthpiece to the side and still play lead. Wow. That's a story. Now, there's maybe somebody out there that can affirm. <laughs> and, of course, uh, Lynn, Lynn became, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know the, 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 the lead screech player for Count Basie. So I guess he got, he wanted, that's what he wanted. His best friend was Bill Chase, and he wanted to, to emulate Bill. Uh, so that's a very unique guy. And, and like I said, I, if you ever meet one, I'd be surprised. A type two is um is uh if you know the uh bobby and paul i don't know if you know the fami- the, the phrase lantern jaw no. lantern jaws you know a guy walks into the room and before you see his face you see his jaw so he's got a real protruding like, big jaw like jay and leno exactly bobby i gotta write that down or anyway. chuck connors member of the <laughs> rifleman oh yeah 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 you're right <laughs> well i think that I'm I'm too young to remember that Paul. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, Jay Leno for sure, and I don't you don't see that. That's a you again. That's a very unique type, and the only guy that I've seen that has that kind of setup, and I, I don't know. I'm not really sure of his name, Paul. You would know him. Uh, he plays in the Fat Band with Wayne, and uh, I think his name is Dave McGurn. He plays jazz. Anyways, he's the fourth mm. trumpet player, and okay. he, he's, he's the jazz player, and he's a wonderful player. And he, if you see him, you'll see that jaw. But again, very, very unique. Now let's get into the bread and the butter, the type three and the type four. Type threes are downstream players. Type fours are upstream players. Now I'm going to talk about the downstream players because within the top three, there's three categories. The first category is a straight type three. Most of those guys are trombone players. They have, they still have an upper lip placement, but it is as low as possible, but still maintaining a downstream position. The most uh, common uh, type three is called a 3B. And a 3B is basically a 60-40 scenario. And being 60 on the top, correct? 60 on the top, yeah. uh, Again, remember, when you think downstream, the first determination is a high placement, whether it's 60, 70, 80, or whatever. Sure. Um, So, but, but great, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, um, the pivot classification for a 3B is pivot classification 2. Again, one is unique. And again, the pivot classification for uh, for the 3B is he slightly lowers and pulls down to ascend and slightly raises his horn and pulls up to ascend. These are these guys are very very common. Now, there's another classification we were talking about a Paul, and you mentioned that Harry James, and I mentioned Chris Bodie. Uh, it's a it, the classification is a three A, very unique. You don't see it very often. There's very few guys that are three A's. Sometimes you look at a guy and he's a three B, like a sixty forty, and you know you may kind of think, well, no, I think his guy he's maybe seventy thirty. So it's a, again, this is an analysis that has to be done. Uh, and I don't like looking at YouTube videos of guys and determining what, what classification they are because I think looks are deceiving. So the 3A is as high a placement as you can imagine. It could be 75, 25. And that's maybe like with Chris Bodie, when you watch him play, uh, his his mouthpiece is very close to his nose. I mean, it's very high. And the other thing that dis- distinguishes uh, uh, Chris as a 3A and, and what distinguishes a 3A 
is that his horn angle is not low and it's not down and it's not horizontal. It's actually very high. But he is still a downstream player. But again, a unique player. Now his pivot classification is a one. When he lifts his horn, he ascends. When he brings the horn down, he descends. And if you see Chris taking a solo and then he takes it off of his chops and then he's got some beautiful singer or some other guy playing great or staying there, you will see a crease on this guy's chops like it's unbelievable. So check that guy out. So that's basically the threes. Now I go to the fours, which are upstreams. There are two upstream types of players. The, 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 the first one the tra is a traditional um, uh, type four upstream player. And the best example I always like to say is uh, Arnie Tchaikovsky, who is well known in, in North America <laughs> from Toronto, played with the Boss Brass, beautiful guy, miss him very much. And he, he, when, he when, when Arnie set up, the head is down and the horn is quite high. But his pivot is when he ascends, he pulls down. When he descends, he goes up. Um, the next classification for, for an upstream player is a 4A. And the difference being they both have low placements to make them upstream players. They both have similar pivots or classifications, pull down to ascend, push up to descend. The difference being the 4A doesn't have the draw to go far enough out, so their position is horizontal or lower. And the interesting thing is, and you'll like this, Paul, because I think you, you, were, you were talking about this one time. If you look at a 4A and you look at a 3B, they both have their horns down horizontal or lower. They both pivot similarly, pulling down to ascend, pushing up to descend. What's the difference? It's the difference that qualifies if you're an upstream or a downstream player. And if you're, uh, uh, the difference is the placement. Okay. So if you got the high placement and your horn angle is down, you're a downstream player. Me, I'm an upstream player. But and my horn is down. Well, actually horizontal, horizontal or, or a little bit down. What's the difference? Lower placement. And because I got injured with the electric needle when I had a cyst on my lip, I have scar tissue where my actual placement was for 15 years. And then I had to lower that placement. And when I lower that placement, believe it or not, I play almost on the red. And it affects your endurance, it affects your range. So that's one of the reasons I had to <laughs> switch and uh, join Yamaha Canada as a product specialist and, and uh, get into the, the, the sales and marketing of band instruments. So I, I, I don't know if you guys have any questions. Is that pretty clear or? or, or, or that is, I have, that one other que I have one other question. And, and that is that I've been told that for certain types or classifications of players, they should be practicing th certain things, um, and, and that's good. Um, and and then there's others that shouldn't be practicing a certain thing. Like for instance, no, nope. no, excellent. That's okay. an excellent, excellent question. I was just going to say I, I want to just really, really uh, throw this out to you guys and to the people listening. Forget about the classifications. The classifications are just pulling up or down. It's okay. just basically pulling up or down. But uh, let's talk upstream and downstream. It's an excellent point, and it's a critical point. If, if uh, um, I'll put it to you this way. Um, if you're a kid playing in a, in a high school band and you're a downstream player, you are able to, in the beginning of your studying the trumpet you because you have a high placement you were able to produce a very good sound an upstream player 
with a lower placement, he has trouble playing a good sound. The reason being is that with the lower placement, the upstream player has a great amount of flexibility. So when you have a lot of flexibility and a lot of compression, it thins out your sound. So it makes sense that an, a, a downstream player who has a has a good sound, he has to work on. He doesn't really have to work on the sound. And I know I know symphony players. I I was I used to be friends with a guy who played in a Winnipeg symphony and and actually now plays in the Detroit symphony. And he used to go uh, fishing and hunting and camping for three three weeks, and he wouldn't touch his horn. And I say, Jesus, how, what happens when you get back? It must be really hard. He says, Nah, it's not a big deal. And he was a he was a he was a downstream player, so he puts that thing on his chops, and he and he can play. So the difference, uh, 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 you have to practice differently. So let's take a downstream player. And I was watching you uh, 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 play uh, on some things, Paul. Um, you're a guy that I, I think I'd have to shave your mustache to figure out what, oh. what we do with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, because you know, I, I can't really tell whether you're an upstream or downstream. I'd, ha I'd have to really take a look. Um, but, but basically, how a, how a downstream player would practice, they can practice for long periods of time. So it's it's not unheard of of a of a of a downstream player, you know, picking up the horn, uh, maybe doing some long tones and maybe doing some flexibilities, doing some finger exercises, finger the clerk studies, uh, doing some tonguing in the rant book or whatever, doing some Charlie A. And for him playing like an hour. But what happens after an hour is it's not particularly that he gets fatigued his top lip swells because with the upper placement, once you start to experience fatigue after 45 minutes or an hour, your weight shifts from your bottom lip, which is your anchor. It shifts to your top lip, your top lip swells, and then you got to take a serious rest and a serious rest is one and a half hours or longer. So basically, if you're a downstream player, let's say you have a rehearsal in the afternoon and then you got a three or four hour break and you got to do the show at night, you're fine. You're OK. What a what an upstream player has to do, he starts the day with his jaw in a fairly receded position, meaning that his sound is uh, not very good. He's all flexibility. He's tight in his cheeks. So basically... What he has to do is concentrate on sound. He has to do a lot more um, long tones, a lot more uh, flexibilities, slow flexibilities. Um, and he can play, he has to play in short spurts. So he can warm up, he can play like a, a, a long tone exercise, let's say for 10 minutes. And then after 10 minutes, he's got to take a 10 minute break. And then he can play for 15 minutes and then he'll take a 15 minute break. I think one of the guys that responded to uh, something that you and Bobby do on the trumpeters uh, uh, 50 plus was uh, my friend uh, uh, and my, uh, I have a lot of respect for Roger Ingram. And, and Roger, if you remember, Roger is, is the epitome of an upstream player, great lead trumpet player, great guy and he told you, I practice for 30 minutes, I rest for 30 minutes. I practice for 30 minutes, I rest for 30 minutes. He does that for the whole day. This is his day. He'll start at 9 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock in the morning, and he'll finish at midnight. But he can only do those short spurts. And why? Because the lower placement can only hold for a certain amount of time, and then it slips out of the groove and you can't play so to th and and when you you're tired when an upstream player is tired he gets that double buzz you get that 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 lip vibration and it's basically it's 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 happening all over the place it's like it's just it's just falling apart and you get like a double buzz i'm trying to think of the terminology and i can't remember but uh that's how an upstream player 
practices. So, you know, basically, if you got an upstream player and, he, and, he, and he's limited in his time and he wants to play for an hour, he's not going to progress too much. But and even and Roger and and the other thing is even Roger uh, made a, this point and it's an excellent point that even if he has a gig or a recording session he will still do two or three sessions <clears throat> he'll play an hour but he'll do like thirty minutes rest thirty minutes play thirty minutes because if he goes to that studio gig or he's or he's playing with Harry Connick Jr. and he doesn't warm up and put his jaw into playing position he's going to have a heck of a time playing. He has to do that warm up. Where a downstream player, eh, he can probably go right to the gig. The other thing is, and this is a critical point, there are some people that will not agree with what I'm going to tell you, but basically, uh, buzz, uh, buzzing was um, um, a way to teach you how to play. If you're an upstream player, you have so much flexibility and so much cre- compression built into your face. Buzzing is just a detriment because what buzzing does is it tightens up. It tightens up your corners. It firms your aperture. It firms everything up, and and not your aperture. I'm sorry, but it firms your your um, your embouchure. Your yeah. embouchure. That's the word I was looking. Thank you, Bobby. And uh, um, uh, so a, a downstream player can can really go to town on buzzing so it's very uh great for a downstream player so you can see that uh when you look at doc's book and if you study with doc you know if you were a downstream player he would design a a, an assignment for you that would be for a a downstream player like you, you wouldn't have to do a lot of sound stuff you know because you inherently physically your makeup dictates that you have a good sound now what a downstream player doesn't have is he usually doesn't have compression so doc would do a lot of buzzing drills with that particular player and um that player has a tendency uh i don't know if you've ever experienced it because i i haven't analyzed you guys but a downstream player if he plays a gig at night and he's really taxed let's say a three four hours uh gig and then he wakes up the next day and everything's tight. That's when Doc would, a lot of guys say, oh, just play softly and take it easy and don't strain and everything. The opposite can be true. What can be true is if you're a downstream player and you're tight in your cheeks, what you have to do is cheek puffs. And if you look in the mirror and you just go like this, the first thing you see Everybody says, oh, Dizzy Gillespie, it's a cheek puff. But what you should be looking at, look at my corners. As soon as I do a cheek puff, my corners come forward. And there's an exercise a doc does, and it's, you know, you put out your cheeks. And once you, once you puff out your cheeks, you gotta you got to really increase the pressure. But that's another, that's a, that's a lesson for someone. <laughs> I'm getting carried away here. You know, well, this is all really interesting because as you're speaking of what would be detrimental or advantageous to certain players, um, yeah. I'm realizing for me, um, and it and it's taken many, many years of being on the road and, and beating the hell out of my myself yeah. and, and all that, yeah. to realize that I really need to spend time in the morning and as you said you know a downstream player would need that hour and a half two three hours whatever off um if i get my warm-up and i go into a practice routine and i do even an hour or an hour and a half and i can i can go that long yeah of course i really need that that time in between so if i've got a two o'clock matinee i'll start at 9 30 in the morning and i'll maybe do an hour an hour and a half but I have that downtime in between when I get to the show, it is fine. And then if I have the second show, it's also fine. But boy, if I don't do that warm up and have that that amount of t- break time in between, I'm not set up for the day. And I discovered that showing up to a gig, um, yes, I can get away with just warming up right before the gig. And I can do that for two or three days in a row, but it'll catch up on me. So then I have to be more diligent to do the morning. So. I suspect it, I'm falling under one, you know, sort of. It leads, it leads me, it leads me to believe, and you know, 
this is a like I said, uh, we should get together one time and just sure. talk. But uh, this leads me to believe that uh, I and I know your horn angle is, is is horizontal and maybe a little bit down. And again, when I look at your chops, I can't really see because I don't like to do it uh, on the screen. Right. But it leads me to believe if you're saying that, it leads me to believe that you're you you you're you're probably a three B. You're probably a downstream. You probably pull down to a stand, push up to descend. Yes. And what happens is why you need that long rest. It's basically when, when, when you do your hour, you reach a point where you start to get fatigued. Everybody has that point. And then, and then you you go from your anchor spot on your bottom lip and it, and your pressure shifts to your upper lip, your upper lip swells and you're done like dinner. And what yep. has to happen is you need, you you need a longer rest or I don't know, maybe What's that? Um, the guy from Maynard's band that does the lip, uh, the lip uh, uh, recovery. Uh, oh, oh, uh, oh, uh, Kenny, Robert, Kenny Robinson, Robinson's remedies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe that's a good thing. But the other thing, Paul. Oh, I like to bathe in that stuff. I love it. But the, <laughs> yeah, but you must be a downstream player, anyways. <laughs> but, but, but the other, or an idiot. The other, but, but the other thing is like, like. The warm up is important because the thing is, like a lot of times when we start the day, our jaw is in our natural receded position. That's why we warm up. And the thing is, it, it's 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 it. You have to do your warm up, and and it's really critical. Now, a guy like you that's playing every night, and and like you say, uh, the the demands of of. Uh, for for a trumpet player playing the shows that you're playing i mean like you say you can have written double a's written double c's uh you got to do delicate stuff you got to do piccolo stuff i mean that's a heck of a a job that you got to do and 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 you have to take care but i'll tell you i was reading doc, some of doc's stuff and you'll like this paul one of the things that doc says for every player before he starts playing in the morning drink two big glasses of water and i know you're a dehydration guy <laughs> you know, it, but, it, it really does help. Yeah, it, it's 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 really, really, really critical. So the thing is, um, um, if you're a downstream player, then you should check out uh, cheek puffing. And I just want to make uh, this is really interesting because I asked Doc about Dizzy Gillespie and I said, Jesus, Murphy, I mean, Dizzy with his cheek puff, everybody, you know, it's like a bullfrog. What's going on there? And Doc says, you know, everybody looks at the cheek puff, but what they don't look at is once he puts the mouthpiece and he starts playing, that thing is solid as a rock. It's solid as a rock. And usually when guys are cheek puffing, the physical uh, reason for that is they have a smaller mouth cavity. That's And most guys, when they play in their upper register, I'd love to be watching you play, play in your uh, uh, upper register uh most of the guys that you see playing in the upper register have some form of puffing. Chase had a neck puff. There's a lot of guys that have an upper lip puff. Maynard had a little bit of a puff down here. So it, it differs for different guys. But, yeah, you have to know yourself. And, and the thing is, you know, uh, if you're a downstream player and, and you start the day with a decent sound, why would you work on sound you know uh, not that you shouldn't work on sound you should work on vibrato you should work on you know your dynamics and everything but uh, I, I i think uh, it'd be interesting i'd love to work with, with to 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 look at your chops it would be uh, uh i love doing that I love <laughs> we'll, bo doing we'll that. both have to shave our mustaches <laughs> <laughs> I'm only shaving half. Yeah. So, hey. I'll, I'll, I'd probably fall over because uh, the <laughs> counterweight is gone then. <laughs> so, hey, Glenn, I know we're just about out of time, but if you would, I, I have one final thing I'd like to ask you to yes, maybe sir. shed some light on here because this has just been really enlightening. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the different tongue types that uh, players have? Because I know this was uh, this was a part of his teaching as well, right? Okay. Um, first of all, I want to make one comment, if you don't mind. Sure. If you guys will allow me to do this. Um, uh, I heard a comment. I don't know if it was a post or a comment. Uh, 
uh, and somebody said that uh, Doc asked most of his players and his and his students to to set up by tonguing. Uh, that's incorrect. Everything that Doc does, everything that he writes, is slurred. Okay, and Bobby, just for your information, that's how the track routine came about. The track routine is a flexibility. I'm sorry, my cell phone's going crazy. Uh, the track routine is is a flexibility exercise. So picture middle C E G. Do 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 do. All of Doc's ex. He would ask everybody to slur that. However, and I'm the guy that that meets that category. If he found that you had a lot of angular motion in your chops when you slur sometimes you watch a guy play and you see him really moving around paul bobby um then he, and then you tongue and there's no movement so you would say okay when you're tonguing your jaw is perfectly aligned your chops are working correctly but when you slur you're moving all over the place so the purpose of the track routine would be tongue first correctly jaw in the right position and on the same breath, slur. And then you train your jaw to learn how to slur. That's the track routine. I'll roughly go over the tonguing things. And Bobby, I can start with you uh, personally. You said that, yeah, I, I, I tried the anchor tonguing, or I tried this, or I tried that. So um, the, the traditional way of tonguing is you tongue behind your top teeth. And it's the old syllables. Doc Severinsen would say this. Uh, ta for the low register. Two for the middle register. T for the upper register. And if you guys could just repeat after me. Ta. 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 Two. Two. T. T. And when you do that, you're going like this. Ta. Two. T. So your tongue angle is going higher and higher and higher and your tongue controls the airstream so when you go t t t t t t t t t that might be a high c or a high e but if you go two 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 that's going to be a middle c or a middle e so that's the number one type of tonguing and that's traditional that's for a guy with just basic average tongue whatever that what dictates the tonguing guys is the length of the tongue and the width of the tongue. So some guys like me, and I'm not bragging now, but I have a little bit of a longer tongue. So when I do the traditional ta to t, it gets pretty sloppy. So if you meet a student that is tonguing traditionally like ta to t, and they're really sloppy, and you work on their tonguing, and you work on the brand book, and you work on whatever tonguing exercises. I know, Paul, you've written a book and, and you have a lot of stuff to say about, you know, how to tongue and, and you know, tonguing exercises, I should say. Um, they can't tongue traditionally. So, Bobby, this is one of the things that I remember you talking about in another video. Those guys will attack behind their teeth. So they'll go ta to t, But after they hit that syllable, they'll go ta and then the tongue will go into the gully. So take your tongue. And you'll you'll go on behind your bottom teeth, and behind the, the rugae there. I'm lisping now, and you put the tongue right in the gully. And what happens is, so you're articulating behind the teeth, but when you sustain, your tongue goes into the gully. So that's a, the second way of tonguing. The third way of tonguing, and this is the way I tongue. It's well, Doc says type five tongue, but. Uh, the common uh, guys commonly call this the anchor tongue. Uh -huh. And what happens is if you have a little bit of a longer tongue and you can determine it when the student is really sloppy tonguing, they just can't deal with their tongue is too, too long for what you want them to do. So you start with the tongue in the gully, excuse me. You start with the tongue in the gully and you actually leave it in the gully and you go ta to, to you can't really see that can you so it's okay, just so back yeah. from the tip of the tongue like yeah yeah there so as you, opposed to the tip yeah 
so what you're what you're basically t- tongue and I want I don't want to say the middle of the tongue but it's it's basically the you know, flat the, of the, the tongue, tongue it, now that is controlling that's controlling the air quantity and you know what a lot of guys that try that they fight me tooth and nail because they say oh I can't do it Glenn it's impossible da 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 but you know what think about it when you have your uh, can you see this Bobby so when you're tonguing behind your teeth, you're going ta, ta, two, two. There's a lot of motion there. When your tongue's in the gully, uh, 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 there's no movement. The only thing is you have to get used to it. You have to get used to it. And Doc would say the only time something is new is the first time. So we talked about pivot classifications today. So tomorrow, Bobby, when you think about pivot classifications, it's not new, my friend, anymore. <laughs> it's day two. I think I understand. I, I think I understand it now a little bit more. Now, That's cool. Now I'm going to give you the last tongue type, uh, and I'm just giving you the general uh, overview. Um, they say you shouldn't tongue bet- be- between your teeth, but there was ex- there are always exceptions to the rules. Please understand that. Doc always said there are always exceptions. Don't, don't, don't put your hand, you know, don't put your head in the sand, you know. And so the fourth, fourth one, you will encounter people or players, whether men or women, that have what I call fleshy, fleshy lips. So kind of fat lips. They'll get, they'll have like a kind of a fat bottom lip. And those people because the you may not see it but when you go when you roll it out you might see that wow they got a big lower lip and those people because of the size of their their fleshy lips they will they will tongue between their teeth off of the lower lip that, that's very it's very unique but it's somebody with you know, really fleshy. Do you know what I mean by fleshy type sure. lips? You, you, you're understanding that? Okay. Absolutely. And that's basically the, the four types. But basically, the tongue is it's very important. I mean, Doc would say there's three three basic things. There's the embouchure, there's tonguing, and there's breathing. You know, so for a for a for a player like like Paul or a player like you, Bobby, uh, when you're a professional player. The, you know, your embouchures are working, you know how to tongue, you, you know, you should be, you know, when you take that hour and a half rest ball, that's, that's when you should be maybe doing some yoga breathing or, or whatever, you know. And by the way, Doc confirms, uh, uh, even though he wrote the book in the 40s and did all of his exercises on the 40s, he's on the same page as our friend uh, Bobby Shu. Uh, you do not protrude your abdomen and uh, you know, and and that, you know, the guys in the '40s, and you know, they were getting a lot of hernias and problems. Uh, you know, he basically says, take a deep breath or take a breath, and then you pull up, and that's how you how you breathe. So he he was on the the same page, or may, maybe Bobby read Bo, uh, Doc's book. I don't know, but uh, they they certainly uh, are on the same page. And I think Bobby is uh, well. He's one of the great educators, obviously. He sure is. Yeah, yeah. I think his he's latest, passed. Uh, I'm sorry, Bobby. His latest uh, video where he describes, uh, I always knew it as the, the three steps to his breath. And right. I think, what has he got five now, Bobby, That uh, on that video? Yeah, there's a lot of clarification on it. But, you know, I mean, he, he had told me that he had, had had a double hernia before, had to get it fixed, and kind of figured it out. And I think it was Bud Brisboy that turned him on to the uh, science of breath, that yoga breath, and that's kind of where where he learned it, or Maynard or somebody. Maynard Maybe gave him the Maynard. book, yeah. I think yeah. Maynard gave him the book, yeah. and, but didn't, but did, you know, but, the interesting but Bud thing did is, as well. the interesting thing is, is that, um, you know, two of the great players uh, of the uh, of the galaxy are, you know, Doc Severinsen and Maynard Ferguson, and uh, I'll tell you, the best, there's a there's a three part clinic that Doc Severinsen does. It's a really older, but the interesting thing is, he does it and he just says this works for me. And like he does this thing where he's doing the stamp things, 
uh, it's a three octave thing and, and he does it and he says, geez, I, I, you know, I, I don't know why it works, but I do it and I like to do it and it works for me. And, and Jimmy stamp didn't put any, any, any written instructions, but it just works, you know? And, and so he doesn't mention names and types and all that kind of stuff. And you've got to respect that because, you know, a guy like Doc Severinsen, if he said, you know, you should do this, everybody would try to do that, you know. So I, I, I have a great respect for, for those players. And uh, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed our, our, our time here, guys. So I, yeah, I want to thank you I so much. Really thank you. I want to really thank you. And uh, again, you and Paul, you're doing a great job and hopefully uh, – uh, we're all we're all learning, you know. We're all learning. Every time I talk about uh, uh, my experiences, or even with Doc Reinhardt, uh, uh, I mean, you guys made me go into the book and read back my notes and everything. So we're always learning, and as long as we keep learning, we're in good shape. Yeah, right, I think exactly. Doc Severinsen is a great example of that. He's always learning, and uh, you know, we had Bobby Shu on a while back, and he yeah, said. I saw. I yeah, and, and he talked about Doc coming to him for a lesson, and he you yes. know, was saying, what can I tell Doc Severinsen? <laughs> but Doc felt like there was something there, and, and I, I'm quite sure there was. So we're always learning, or we should always be learning. Yeah. And you know what? I, I've never, I, you know, when you talk to, you know, serious trumpet players, I mean, guys that really want to learn and know, and, you know, it's just like, it's just like me. I can help you and, and maybe tell you some stuff about uh, – the pivot system and doc reinhardt but then you know if, you know like i don't uh alex in toronto has helped me with some stuff with jimmy stamp and and you know if i wanted to learn about jimmy stamp i guess you know i'd i'd want to learn from a student like bobby bobby studied with jimmy stamp so yep. you know maybe we can get together bobby and you can you can help me with jimmy stamp stuff and i can help you with with questions sure, about Sure, I'd love to. I mean, this is one of the beauties I, I think about the synergy Paul and I have together because we both come from different playing backgrounds and we've both gone through a lot of issues ourselves. Yeah, and we've yeah. learned bits and pieces from all these different systems and through our own experiences of trying to get through gigs and by our own experimentation. So I'm not really tied to any sort of a method. It's just more just a sort of like Doc said, I've found the things that worked for me. And then, uh, you know, and then hopefully I can pass some of those things on and, and occasionally things that didn't work for me. At one point, I have one of these, ah, now I yeah. see, now it's working two yeah. years later or five years later or something, yeah. you know? So we have those little, uh, as Bobby Shue calls them, oh shit moments, you yeah. know? <laughs> and uh, anyways, Glenn, it's been so great having you. Man, we really appreciate you, you taking the time to chat with us and hang out here. And, uh, you know, we'll, we it. will, and we will get together. We'll get together, you and I, and probably anytime, Paul and I, and we'll, we'll. Uh, anytime you guys are, anytime you want to get together, I'm there for you. That's and so thank, you very, thank you very much for having me, and uh, uh, it was a pleasure. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Glenn. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.